Like I know that I want to play at the highest level possible and to keep pushing myself and keep that focus and, and, and when that focus and that self self drive goes is when I know that that I'm done and until I lose that I'll keep going and trying to play as high level as I can. So thank you, Jack, for joining me. Pleasure. Um, I appreciate it, mate. And uh, so to start us off, where do you think talent ranks in the attributes needed to be successful as a footballer uh, and how important was that for you? It's funny you say that, actually, because um, I've been having this conversation quite a lot recently, whether you're born with talent and that's all you need or you, you, you learn it as you go along. Um, and in my opinion... But I do think that talent plays a big part, yeah. So has your opinion on, on being born with talent or whether you grow into it changed over time? or? Um, I just think about, like, I look at my children now um, and when I was a kid and the boys I played with when I was a kid. And look at, I mean, at the time when I was, was growing up and playing, I never thought that I was anything different to anyone. Um, having conversations with my dad and other people they said that they could see something different, but um, I do, I do think that you're born with something, and then you have to work it. Of course, you have to work it, and if you don't work it, it's not just going to happen. You have to keep working, and of course, you're going to have weaknesses within that talent that you have to work on and try and improve. But I do think, yeah, that you're born with with something. How old were you where you when you realised you had to work hard, obviously as well as being talented? Um, you know, I was just one of them kids who loved football. Like I think about my kids now and and whether they love football as much as I did and probably not. I mean, times have changed, of course. There's all kinds of things they can do now, which we couldn't do when we were younger. You know, it was we used to go out and have a ball and that was it. And um, so I remember from a young, young age, thinking, always thinking I need to work hard. And you know, coming, through, I was lucky enough to come through a good academy. Um, but at the same time, there was still, a, I felt a lot of pressure, you know, we used to get like two year, two year sort of deals where you, at 12s, 14s, 16s, and I remember all the time coming up to to the end of the, the two years thinking, oh, are they going to sign me on again? And I need to work hard, I need to improve on this. So I was pretty young when I realised that I had to work hard. A lot of people were probably expecting that your journey in youth football was, you know, you just went step by step, straight away successful. Um, you're talking there about being feeling some sort of pressure as as the end of these two year deals came along. Were the coaches giving you feedback as in that made you feel like you were successful at that age, or or did you question it? Yeah, listen, I'm I'm the first to admit I was lucky to come through a good academy at Arsenal. You know, we had everything, we had the facilities, we we were able to go abroad from a young age to play against the best teams in you know, Barcelona, Juve, teams like that, and. So, I mean, listen, I started at, at Luton Town and at nine years old, I went to Arsenal and had, had the best facility. So, yeah, but the coaches being as good as they were, I still put pressure on myself because, you know, I knew where I wanted to go. I used to, especially when I got a little bit older, you know, like 14, 15, and I'm looking at the first team and, and Fabregas played when he was 16. So that was something that I just wanted to do and I felt like I could do it and, I was given the best opportunity because of the facilities and the coaches and everything. But at the same time, I always put pressure on myself. You mentioned your your dad telling you that he saw something in you that was, uh, you know, a bit better than the other guys that you were playing against. Did the coaches make you feel that way as well? Or or were you just, you know, you just were there and you, and you felt good and, and that was that? No, the coaches never made me feel like that. And, and to be honest, my dad didn't make me feel like that when I was at that age. It's only since getting older and having conversations with him and, you know, probably since, since I've had kids and, you know, watching them and thinking and watching them against other boys their age and thinking, oh, have they got something different? And 
and that's when my dad said, "No, I could tell at like five or six that you were you was you had something different." And but the coaches at Arsenal never really, never really made me feel like that. I mean, if if one, I mean, growing up, I used to play up a lot, and you know, there, there could be one or two from my age group that played up. And and if I think about it now, then probably yeah, I was pushed a little bit more than maybe some others, but. You know, at the time, I just thought that, you know, I'm just, they need a few numbers and I'm one of them going up. And so, no, they never really, the coaches never really made me feel any different to any other one else. The, um, I've heard you speak about your, you know, your relationship with with your parents and that they didn't really put any pressure on you to play uh, when you were a kid. And that sort of came from within you. But. To see Fabregas playing at 16 years old and for that to be, uh, you know, an ambition of yours, especially now where, you, you know, you watch 16-year-olds playing football and they're a long way away from, from being in a first-team environment. How did you manage to to build that opinion or, or that ambition from such a young age to, to want to do that? I just had that drive in me. You know, I moved into Diggs when I was 14. So all I knew was being around, you know, my teammates and, you know, at that age especially at Arsenal, it would be an age where they'd, they'd get a lot of players in from abroad, you know, the best players. We got a midfielder from, from Barcelona, who was my age. We had a, another midfielder um, from Italy, who was my age. And I was just always thinking, I need to be better than them because they've been brought in. And that's the way that the football is, you know, that like if, if someone gets brought in for a bit of money, then they could be pushed a little bit more than you. So I had that in me from a young age to think, I need to be better than him whenever I went on the pitch. And to be fair, I have to be thankful to to the coaching staff at uh, at Arsenal and, and the manager in, in Arsene Wenger. He saw something in me and, and he pushed me from a young age and gave me that opportunity. You know, I spoke about that before. Having that opportunity is key. I mean, my first, my first real season in the first team came because there was, I think there was six or seven midfielders injured in the first game. And, and then, yeah, when you get the opportunity, you have to take it. But, Without them injuries, I probably wouldn't have got that that start. It was at Anfield away. I definitely wouldn't have got that start. And um, yeah, I mean, it was down to me to take that opportunity. But you have to be given that chance first. Being involved in first team training sessions at fifteen is, you know, is pretty unique, especially at, at that sort of level. Did that change your approach to to what you were doing at the time? Did do you remember what you were doing in training on a daily basis? Did did that experience change that? Well, I remember there being a lot of pressure when, you know, because you could come in one morning and, and the youth team manager will say to you, oh, the, the first team needs you today. And I remember feeling a lot of pressure. Um, and I remember also, it was, I wasn't the only one who, who would go over there and some players would go over there and crumble and then they wouldn't be asked to go back over for six months. So, like, there was players of a similar ability to me, but I think I was better at, taking my opportunity when it came, whether that be in training and, you know, making an impression, not just going over there and thinking, right, I need to get through this, actually making an impression and, you know, making sure the manager goes away and thinks, oh, you know, uh, Jack, he's good, he's good enough, he's, he might be 15, but he's not that far away. Young kids um, probably ov obviously aspire when they're in the youth team to, to train and to be involved with the first team, but we all know what it's like when, you, when you're actually told you're going to be involved, you get nervous, like it's, it's you know, you feel anxious. Um, what do you think it is about you and, and for obviously for young kids listening to this that allowed you to, to deal with that better than, than like you say, some of the other people that went over there and, and crumbled? Yeah, I think from a young age, I, I understood that once your opportunity came, you had to take it. And, and of course, that, that comes with some fear. And I think the biggest thing is fear. You know, I think it's fear of failure, failure from a young age when you go over there and you, you almost, you don't want to make mistakes and you keep telling yourself, don't make mistakes and then you make mistakes. And I was, I was able to block that out and, and just focus on, on myself and why I'm actually there. You know, I worked my way through the academy. I deserve to be there. You know, there was players, as I said, of a similar ability next to me who were there. So we all deserve to be there, but you had to make an impression on the manager. Uh, you've mentioned it a little bit already, but young players now have loads of stuff that they can do, whether it be sit on the PlayStation and, and uh, you know, watch the internet. But for you, when you were growing up, football was, was everything to you. Um, how did you build 
your philosophy on football. And by that, I mean that you are sort of a, a modern day player way beyond your time. You, you played football that people hadn't really seen before. How did you manage from a young age to build that perception of how you wanted to play? Yeah, um, I think a lot of it came natural. And what I mean by that is I always had a natural ability with the ball and that came from a very young age. I remember playing school football at seven or eight and, you know, I could I could dribble with the ball better than anyone else. Also, I think being at a club like Arsenal, um, who's who when Arsenal came in, he obviously changed the whole culture of the club. Um, he wanted to play total football, play out from the back at, at a time when that weren't really... Like no one ever did that really, and and that went all the way through the academy. The 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 coaches and the academy director were all briefed on how we wanted to play, and it was always with the ball, always technical, always everything we did from under tens to under sixteens was with the ball, and and I suppose I just embraced that and and used it as my strength because I was always that was one of my strengths with the ball. You know, I weren't the biggest, I weren't the quickest, but I could always make space with the ball. My first touch was always good, and I just always took that on with me if I was training with the 18s or the first team I always remember thinking right concentrate on your strengths show your strengths and, and make an impression on the manager did you have a preferred position at, at that age um, when I was coming through the academy I was actually a winger yeah I was a, a left winger um, actually played left back as well I remember uh, the head of the academy at the time was Liam Brady and he was obviously a similar player to me and he said to me once, I think I was about 13 or 14, we went to a tournament in in Holland. He said, I want you to play left back. And I was like, anyway, I played there. Obviously, didn't do very well because they, they moved me back into midfield. But, um, and then when I got into the 18s, into the youth team, the under 18s, I was only like 15. Um, we played a, a diamond and I was playing top of the diamond. So I think Arsenal and the whole club always saw me as a, almost like a number 10 off the striker. Um, I used to have not arguments but disagreements with the manager saying I want to play deeper and he, he would always say that he sees me as a number 10. Um, and to be honest with you, I, I did enjoy playing playing as a number 10. I think as I've got a little bit older and you know, I think as well that role of the number 10 has changed. You know, you don't really see now like, a, especially in England, like an Ozil or someone like that who who just wants the ball to feet, you know, that, that role's changed. You have to run behind um, probably more times than you're coming to feet. So I think as 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 it's changed, I've I found myself more comfortable playing deeper. You're obviously talking about there that, you, you know, a left back and left midfield. Um, people often who, who are attacking players end up in defence and the op opposite way round. What for, for kids at that age who are struggling to find a position or to, to see how they can be effective on a match day in a, in a certain position, what advice would you give them as to, to how to find out? I think it's important when you're growing up not to... You know, and every player, everyone listening to this will always will always think that they know where they want to play and where they they should be playing. But I think, as, especially when you're really young, growing up as a kid, you should... You should try and embrace every single position because, and why I say that is because if if and when you go on to play men's football, you get into a first team, if the manager asks you to play somewhere, you have to do it. And that might be your opportunity. Like I said, when your opportunity comes, you have to take it. So I think you have to know a little bit. I mean, listen, if you're left-footed then I, I sh and you think you should play midfield, I don't think you should be ruling out a left back role or a left wing because that might be your opportunity to get into the team and, and keep your place in the team. And when it comes, you have to take it. The um, so your perception of football, obviously, that we've spoken about, obviously, having a philosophy of having the ball all the time. Um, was everybody else your age doing that as well? Uh, and by what I mean in that, obviously, Arsenal were were teaching you to do that. But was that your opinion of how football was played anyway? It was at the time because that's all I knew. You know, I came for Arsenal, and that was all we were taught. Um, obviously, then when I was eighteen, I went on loan to to Bolton, and it was completely different. You know, so I think you have to play to to your strengths in the team. So when I was at Bolton, 
we had big Kevin Davis up top. Do you know what I mean? We weren't ever going to play out and try and try and play through the lines. It was right. We get it, we get it to Kevin Davis and we, we work off him and, and it worked. You know, we finished 14th in, in, the, in the Premier League that year and that was fantastic for Bolton. So um, my philosophy on, on football is always changing and I think you have to be open to that because things change. You know, I spent, as you said, 10 years at Arsenal couple of loan spells in there where one was here at Bournemouth and I learned a completely new style of playing and and it helped me. I think it benefited me. I learned new things. I went back to Arsenal, had a good year. Um, and now I'm back here in a completely different league and in a in a tough league where I think you have to change your, your style every game. You know, it depends on who you're playing against. Yes, you have to have your philosophy as a club, as a team, but you have to be able to to change that depending on who you're playing and, and what happens in the game. And I think that's one of the biggest things I've learned growing up in, in football is you have to be able to change and adapt during a game. The, you've spoken about, mentioned already, obviously, the, the manager trusting you from quite an early age. And that's quite obvious because, you, you know, you're Arsenal's youngest ever player at 16, 16 years old and 256 days. Um, during that experience, what did you learn from from that? It was Blackburn away, wasn't it? I've read. Um, what did you learn from that experience? Um, you know what that that year was a strange year because yeah, I was pushing the year before, but I was in the youth team and only training with the first team. Um, and I came back in pre season, and I think it was. Was it 08? I think it was 08, and that was the year of the Euros. So, you know, we had the big the big players, Fabregas, Van Persies, they were still away. And they had an extended holiday. So I came up, came back, and I was with the first team. Um, and I probably surprised myself with how well I did. Um, and then the season started, and I was on the bench a few times. And in my head, I was like, why am I not playing? I want to play. And I obviously got on the pitch against Blackburn, and that only increased that hunger. I wanted to get on, get on the pitch more, and you know I thought I was ready. And obviously, looking back now, I knew I weren't ready. And it wasn't until what was it two years later, maybe a year and a half later, when I went on loan and came back, where I realised now I'm actually not ready. And and then that was the following season where where we had a lot of injuries, and I started playing, and and that's when I feel the club and the manager really show faith in me because as you said you look back now and you see 16 17 year olds who who are nowhere near it and i was probably similar i was probably closer to it than a lot of players are now but to play in a, a club where there's a lot of pressure financially because we obviously moved stadiums a few years before we hadn't won anything in a few years um, and we we knew we had to get top four that was the that was that was the objective and to play someone with little experience of, of that pressure in you know i think i played something like 30 33 games that year so yeah that was that was uh the year where i learned most you know i, I grew up pretty quick I mean, even the first game anfield away you know i felt like i did all right but i gave the ball away and and, and they scored and we, we drew one all so you know, little things like that where managers could easily just say i'm oh, gonna no, miss the next one he showed a lot of faith in me I've heard you speak about that moment at, at Liverpool, actually, and the trust that he, that he gave to you to, yeah. to play. What was the difference between after the game? And obviously, you, you mentioned giving the ball away. So I can imagine after the game, you must have felt some sort of responsibility for that. And then after, when you're still being picked uh, and you're still playing. Yeah, that, that I think, I mean, after the game, I was devastated. I remember it. And, then, you know, I'm, I'm one, even now, I'll look back at, I watched the games back and I remember thinking straight away after the game, oh no, I gave the ball, I didn't play well. But then I watched it back and I thought, actually I did play well and I gave the ball away because I mean, it was sloppy. But you know what, Liverpool are like at Anfield, they're, they're all over you, the fans are on you. and So that was a a moment where I grew up a lot as well. And then to be to be selected for the next game, you know, Arsenal wasn't really one to to dig you out. I mean, he'd let you know if, if it weren't good enough, but he was more of what, he'd let you know what he wants from you, what he needs from you. And, and we had a conversation after that. And I think the next game was, 
it was a home game. I think it might have been against Bolton actually. And I played and uh, I think I got two assists, played well and you know, I just went from strength to strength after that and but a big part of that was the confidence shown in the manager because listen, confidence in, in football is massive for everyone and like there could be a moment you could have the best game in in your career and there's one moment where you give it away and you get punished, they score and that's all you remember, that sticks in your head. But I think it's important to to watch the game back even if you feel like you didn't play well to watch it back learn from it and, and move on see when you talk about um that reflecting back on your debut as a 16 year old you you realized later you weren't ready what specifically do you mean by you weren't ready like what was the difference between you at 16 and then a couple of years later where you could look back and have that opinion of yourself well i think i understood after coming back from bolton what it actually meant and, and what I mean by that is, you know, I went to Bolton and there were players there, well, a lot of players and, and the club really, and you can see what happened to them now, who needed to stay in the league. They needed to win. They needed to get the win bonuses to pay their mortgages. And there was a real togetherness at Bolton of everyone who understood that. And oh, I'm frank, thankful to them as well because there's a lot of experienced pros there and who could have thought, oh, who's this kid coming from Arsenal? We don't want to... You don't know what it means, but you know they accepted me straight away. I played 14 games, and I felt like I was really a big part of it. Um, and then obviously I went back to to Arsenal, and I, I carried that with me. Obviously, it was different pressures at Arsenal, but I carried that that winning mentality with me, know, knowing that when you cross that line on on a Saturday, that's when it matters. That's when you have to produce. And yeah, of course, you do everything in the week and training to prepare for that and make sure you're right. But actually what matters is, is the Saturday and getting the three points. So you've spoken about the, the things that I've obviously watched of, of you speaking about your early experiences at Arsenal. You've, you tell a story about how one of your friends who was the masseuse um, gave you the info that some of the older players were, um, were unhappy that you were trying to make them in training and, and that you were trying to say that, oh, you should be playing ahead of them um, as a young 16 year old. Was there ever a moment back then that you felt accepted by the by the players? Um, and what sort of environment was that like to be in? Yeah, I think that was before I went to Bolton, you know, because I was just training. Um, yeah, I think it might have been. Yeah. yeah, it was. It was when I, I remember it was like I was just training. I might have played a Carling Cup game or something. Um, and uh, and I was uh, listen. I'm not that type of player who will try and make someone on purpose. But if it's there, then you're going to do it. <laughs> and uh, now I remember one occasion as well. I played in an FA Cup game. I hadn't played in age. I was 17 at the time. Played away at at West Ham Upton Park, um, and I got battered. Like I was playing right wing. Um, I kept getting the ball to feet and the fullback would be right up me and I'd lose it. And I remember William Gallas absolutely hammering me. And I remember thinking at the time, like, nah, that's poor for me. Like, why is he doing that? I'm obviously trying to get into the team, trying to build a career. But then I look back when I came back from Bolton and I thought, you know what, he was probably right. And I, I, listen, I never, ever hold it against someone who, an older pro who's trying to hammer someone because I'm, kind of in that position now. I'm not listen, I'm not that type who will hammer a young player in training because I don't think it's right. But there are times when when they need to be told and there's ways of telling them. But I always remember coming back and it wasn't I didn't feel accepted, but it was always like I was trying to prove myself to them, which I think is right. I think you are trying to prove to them that you deserve to be in the team and they're your teammates. Um but I remember after the Barcelona game at home when we beat them, and I remember Sami Nasri saying to me, "You, you, uh, you went up a level there. You've gone up a few levels, and like you're ready for this now." And I always remember that moment. Always sticking my head. He was great for me, Nasri. Like many people have different opinions about him, but he was actually really good for for young players. Like he wasn't old himself. He was probably 23, 24, but I was 18, and he was really good. Like he always. He always tried to, to pick me up or give me confidence in training and yeah, he was good. Is he the main player of that era that, that sticks with you as, as being helpful? Um, yeah, him and him, Fabregas, Van Persie, like they were, they were never negative. Like 
they would never have hammered me for giving the ball away or anything. Seth would probably as well go out of his way and like just little things like when you're walking out to training, like put his arm around you. And listen, Seth for me was like my hero. You know, as I said before, when I was I must have been 12. He was 16 in the first team, and I wanted to be him. And then all of a sudden, to play with him week in, week out was massive for me. And for him just to put his arm around me and say, like, oh, that was good, or you did well. And he'd even do it, like, when I was sort of training with the first team and playing in the youth team, playing the youth cup, like, he'd make he'd go out of his way and, like, put his arm around me and said, oh, I watched the game the other night. You were really good. And, like, that just gives you confidence. I'm interested to know um, you now training this morning. How would you deal with a with a sixteen year old Jack Wilshire? How would you treat him? Um, well, as I said, I'm not one like I would never hammer one. Or you know what? I I, I like, I'm thinking today because we played against the uh, the young players. Um, like I, I try and treat them as I would anyone else. Like I'm talking like someone like Jeff Lerma or, or like because we obviously have conversations on the pitch. I play next to him or. If, if I don't know, if Adam Smith does something wrong, I'll tell Adam. So I'm the type of player who will accept it as well. So like if they say it to me, I'm not one to throw my, my toys out of the pram and be like, no, nah, nah, that's not right. Like, I'll accept it. So I'd, I'll try and treat a young player like like they deserve to be. Like they're one of us, they're with us because they deserve to be there. Um, they're helping us, like they're helping us prepare for the weekend. So yeah, I'll try and treat them the same. The uh, and so moving on, obviously, we'll speak a little bit about this Bolton loan that you went on. That was, uh, you know, you reflect on being quite important for you. Um, during that time leading up to it, you you speak about pestering the manager to to play more, and it ended up with you obviously going to Bolton. Um, I know you've mentioned growing up there and and realizing about winning games and how important that was. But what were the long lasting memories and uh, you know and takeaways from that experience that you had? Yeah, I mean, how it came about was, like you said, I would be knocking on the manager's door. He told me that I was going to play games that year and it got to to January and I'd probably only played about 10 games. I made 10 appearances and most of them were in the cup. So I kept on at him and he was like, no, look, you're going to play, I need you here. And then it wasn't until, I think it was deadline day where he said, you can go. Um, and I had a few options and I drove up to Bolton with my dad and got out, spoke to Owen Coyle, um, and yeah, that was I knew that was where I wanted to be. And um, but it was strange because one thing that sticks out, and I always kept this with me throughout my whole career. Wherever you go, don't matter who you are, or what you've done, you're not guaranteed to play. There's a process, and that was for me difficult to understand when I first went there because I thought, right, he told me I'm coming here to play games, and I think for the first three or four games I was on the bench, um, and it wasn't until until I got given that opportunity where I shoot and I showed him what I could do when I stuck in the team. But what always stuck with me through my whole career is like, obviously I was lucky enough to spend a lot of years at Arsenal, but when I went to West Ham, uh, so when I first came here on, on loan to, to Bournemouth, I knew that there's a process, like you have to train well and it doesn't matter who you are, you have to give everything. And when your opportunity comes, no matter how old you are or where you've been, what you've done, you have to take it. and. I've kept that with me and that's helped me a lot through my career understanding why I'm not playing or why he's playing ahead of me. So I think that that is one of the biggest lessons I took from there and obviously in on the playing side of things, um, growing up, and, and I know that sounds like a cliche, but I did actually grow up a lot because I learned how to win really. I mean, I grew up at Arsenal where most youth team games would win. You know, we had a good, good uh, youth team all the way through, really, like 12s, 13s, 14s. All I knew was winning. And I thought that that would be the way even when you got into the first team. And it wasn't. Like, yeah, you know, even through my limited experience of playing the Carling Cup, FA Cup at a young age, I knew that this was different. This was men's football. And I wouldn't completely understand it or or learn how to to get through it until i played consecutive games probably at a club like bolton who who were fighting for their lives that time so bolton obviously the different style of play to what you were used to and 
the reason why I want to talk about it a little bit is because there's probably loads of guys out there, young guys who have a certain style of play or how they want to play, but are now in an environment or a team that plays different. Um, how difficult was it for you to be Jack Wiltshire in a Bolton team that possibly didn't play to your strengths as a player? Yeah, I think you have to you have to keep your identity of who you are as a player, but you have to learn and embrace new things because it. I came from Arsenal in the youth team, breaking into the first team where you probably have 70% possession of a game and teams would drop off and it was down to you to take the game to them, keep the ball, move the ball. And then all of a sudden I went to a team where it was the opposite, you know, Bolton, who, who weren't really going to try and play nice football. It was get it up to Kevin Davis, get on the second balls, you know, defensively sit in a low block and and try and stop the team, the better teams, from, from breaking you down. So I learned a lot on, on that side of things as well. But I think as well that is, that's a good question and it's important because, you know, I think about boys who I grew up with who grew up in the Arsenal Academy, learned the Arsenal way, learned how to play total football just with the ball, then never actually made a career in football because it's actually, you know, unless you're in that 0.1% who actually make it at Arsenal, then it's difficult out there. You're probably going to go to a League Two or a League One team who who aren't going to have the ball. Who are going to play completely different football. You have to head the ball. You know, you have to fight every week. You know, you're playing three games a week as well, and it's completely different. So, I think if you are in that position, I think it's important you keep your identity of who you are and what your strengths are, but also learn to adapt. We certainly, obviously, at my level in in the conference, like we see loads of guys who've have a certain style of play and sometimes unfortunately it just doesn't fit but I think they think they're going to be able to walk into that level but it's you know it's not that easy yeah I, as I said I, I've got you know loads of players who I played with who were top top young players who had a chance to make it Arsenal but never actually worked out but then just dropped out of the game because as you said they went to a low, lower team lower division team who who demanded different things and if you know, if you're a fullback and you're coming from Arsenal, it's completely different. Like you have to tuck round, you know, win headers, and and then think about getting forward. Whereas if you're at Arsenal, you know, a lot of you know, you look at their first team now, the Tierneys, the Bellerins. Even now, with Arsenal not being what they were when when I broke through, they're still, you know, the majority of the time on the forward foot. They're trying to break teams down and. It's, it's different. I mean, you have to learn to adapt. And I think that's important. Um, I know we're yo-yoing a little bit in terms of your, say, these early years of your career. Um, but this first proper season that you call it in uh, in 2010-11, um, you make your England debut and, and the manager at the time, Capello, calls you the future. Um, you make 49 appearances for Arsenal in, in all competitions and they finish third. Um, what did regular first team football at both of those levels um, do to develop your talent? Obviously, because as, as a kid growing up, like you say, you had a certain style of play. You've been to Bolton, you come back, now you know what winning's about. How did you manage to merge the two and become obviously so important to everybody to, to play that many that many games? Um, yeah, so when, when I made my England debut, it was before the start of the season. So it was, we just finished pre-season. I'd, I'd had a good pre-season. I wasn't sure if I was going to gonna play as much as I wanted to at Arsenal. Um, and then I played for England, which gave me massive confidence. If it was, I think it was about 15 minutes, but it still gave me confidence. And, you know, I think if you watch, watch games throughout that season, which I've done, you can see me growing in confidence as a player. And I think that's a lot a lot of what helped me get through that season you know the first first game at Liverpool right, it didn't go well but I got confidence after watching it again thinking yeah it's done alright and I slowly became more confident and I think the more confident I got the more you saw of, of the actual real Jack Wilshire and and then obviously when we beat um, Barca in the in the Champions League that was like the Feb that was like when I was getting to the peak of that of of myself and how I felt. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of that was confidence and, you know, I knew I had the ability, but I didn't, 
I wasn't sure if I was ready to play playing Arsenal's first team. Obviously, I thought I was, but then, as you said, when you actually get the chance, that's when you know you get nervous. You you start having a few doubts, but you know I was good at blocking them out and and just focusing on myself and what got me there and what I was good at and what I'm in the team to do. And then, yeah, my confidence has grew throughout the whole season. You talk about that Barca game, and I don't think probably any interview that you do can people don't want to talk about it so I mean I've heard you discuss that game with other people in you know in interviews and stuff that you actually finished that game and didn't really think you had played that well that you that you know it took some of the other the other guys to tell you how good you'd been and and for people to reflect on that game did you just think then at that time like that's I've just another normal game that I've played that no, wasn't that but it was so I played the in the Champions League before that and I'd obviously played that year in the group stages and and then I remember watching the draw with a few of the lads and Barca we got drawn against Barca and I remember a few of the lads going oh no because the year before uh, it happened the same thing happened and I think they got smashed something like 6-2 or something and I remember like thinking oh are they that good and then I remember starting the game and thinking oh my god like this could be 4-5 or five. like they had a few chances they used to make these little passes through midfield where you just couldn't do anything about it. And and I don't know what it was, but something something changed in the game. I think, you know what it's like in a game, something can happen and it just gives you a lift and the fans were unreal that game and you know, they got behind us and that helped. But um yeah, I mean I remember thinking the first half uh, I didn't actually do do that well. I mean, I made a few tackles, a few passes forward that started attacks. But I remember the second half. I remember thinking, coming off, thinking, right, I should have scored. I had a chance to score, and I should should have assisted. I I should have pulled the ball the ball back across the goal, and I think it was Abidal who who blocked it. Um, and yeah, it wasn't actually. I think I think the first person who came to me after the game was the kit man. And like he was just giving me some banter about Xavi and Iniesta and like how I ran past them and all like loads of times and uh, and then I remember saying to Seth, "Go oh, get me Messi's shirt." And Seth was like, "What are you talking about? Messi's just been in your pocket. Go and get it yourself." And I was like, "Was it actually that good?" And then I, I remember obviously getting onto social media and and seeing my name trending and that, and, and then watching it back and thinking, "Oh yeah, I did actually play really well." Um, but no, it was a strange, it was a strange, I, I, you know what, I am quite like that though, after games, I, even the last game, I know someone from, from Wickham and after the game he came up to me and he was like, oh, you play well? And I was like, no, no, I didn't. I'm just like that straight away. I'm, I'm, I'm really self-critical. I mean, as I said before, I like to watch the game back after and then I can really judge it. But straight away after, I'm really self-critical. Um, I think a lot of guys at your level, it's pouring down the rain. Mm. Um, a lot of guys who are playing at your level and, and have that elite mentality will often never really truly know if they had played well or not because it sort of comes down to really fine details. Mm. Um, but during that period of time, we're talking about this one Barca game, but obviously you were consistently playing at that level. Was the Barca game for you almost uh, a confirmation to everybody else? Like, I am this good, I am playing at this level. Like, you've just seen it once. Yeah, I think that that was what it was as well because... I'd been playing well for a while. You know, I felt I was pretty consistent. I felt really good. My confidence was high going into that game, even before that game. And then, yeah, I think because it was the Champions League, you know, it was Arsenal v Barcelona, it was everyone watched it. I think that was when people actually thought, oh, no, he is actually quite good. Yeah, because you know what? You know what it's like as well for an English player growing up? You see it a lot. You know, a lot of people think, um, oh, if he if he wasn't English, the English media wouldn't be as as hyped up about him as they are. And I think that was when people thought, oh no, you know what? Actually, he's quite good. I, I mean, I, personally, for me, I I think I watched that game and was pleased that you were getting recognition at the time for the football that you were playing. And by by that, I mean Barcelona were, were everybody's go to to watch because of the football that that they played. But because you were now being perceived as playing that same sort of style of football which isn't really an English thing yeah. um, you start to get a lot more credit for, for obviously the level that you were playing at did you feel like 
the put you know the comparison between you and these Spanish guys um did you like that or or because the rest of the English players weren't weren't really playing football that way yeah no I did like that and one of the main reasons I like that is because someone who I used to look at and try and base my game around was Iniesta um and then to be compared to him was nice but I mean it was it was that year was strange because and I've probably got got that got got it back now but like you go through things in your career and like but that year I really had a mentality of right I was going to show everyone and I'm good enough to be here and I want to I want to prove to people that I am and that that stuck with me for a few years but then obviously when injuries come and, and things happen you have doubts and but I think throughout my career I've always used that year as a reference to go back to that same mentality of right it doesn't matter who you're playing against it doesn't matter if you're playing in the Champions League or the Championship every game is a chance to show to people and prove to people that you belong to either uh, During that time can you remember what sort of like your football lifestyle was um, your training days your habits at home like how were you living your life obviously to consistently perform at that top level from a young age I was always the type of kid growing up who wouldn't eat McDonald's and little things like that that, that I just wouldn't um, and then when I when I broke into the first team I was I was the same I was focused um, I used to live right I was I was at a point in my life and I always had this feeling as well. It was like, I signed a deal, but I wasn't happy with it. And it was strange because I remember people in the same the same uh, youth team or players breaking through into the first team would be talking about that type of thing. Like, oh my God, I've got this, I've got that. And I never, never had that. I was always thinking, right, what can I get next? Or how am I going to get to a point where they have to offer me another one? And that was the way I was living. That was my drive. That was my focus. Um, and it really came, like, became serious in that year where I realised that I was going to be playing week in, week out. I had to prepare right. I had to make sure that that I was in the best condition I could be when, when Saturday came because, as well, I look back then and I was still only, you know, I was 18. I had an 18-year-old's body. I wasn't fully grown or fully developed and... You know, I had to, to make sure I could give myself that extra 5 or 10% going into a Saturday. Um, it's interesting, the guys that I've spoken to who have or are playing at the top level, they all talk about how they they never really spend any time being satisfied with what they've done and they always seem to to look at what's next. Is that something that you, obviously, that, yeah. that an attitude that you had from an early age? Yeah, I had that from a really, a really early age and then... I've always had that even now as well like if we finish a game and I've played well the team's played well we've won I always think yeah but we've got to go again next week we have to we got I don't know it could be anyone we've got to play them or you know I need to to make sure I can produce that again how am I going to do that and I think you have to you ha like a lot of people and there'll be players out there who are playing in a, in a good level who are younger and they don't really realise that because their, their, their ability or the team they're playing in gets them through. But you have to do the things that, that, and all the little things that add up, you need to eat right, you need to get a right amount of sleep. If you need to see a physio or get a massage, you have to do that to make sure you're right. The, I'm interested to know a little bit about as well, because you, you talk about after that game, um, in particular, going on your phone and seeing mentions on, on whatever it was, social media. Um, obviously now, Social media is such a big part of football. It wasn't sort of probably when you were first grown up into the first team. Um, how have you managed to deal with, with social media, positive and negative um, in football? And also moving forward from that, what advice would you give to, to people about how to deal with the pressure of social media? Yeah, well, when I first, first broke into the team, I remember I was one of the first guys on Twitter and I remember a lot of people saying, well, what are you doing? Why are you on there? And I remember just using it as banter almost. Like I'd have banter with the, the Spurs fans, they'd give me banter back or talk about the game. But now it's, it's completely changed. You know, a lot of teams, clubs, 
sponsors. You have to do things for social media. That's part of the that's part of the game now. And it, I think it is is more difficult now for for someone coming through, especially at the big clubs. Um, and I think there has to be a like a support network on on teaching players how to how to use it and how to deal with it because listen, we're we're all human and you could have a good game and think you had a good game and then you go on social media and you read your your comments and that one person who said oh you didn't do this you didn't do that or you you know you you've been bad today that always sticks in your head and I think that can affect you and and there's a lot of people saying that oh, that don't affect me I don't care but I think. I think as humans, you carry that with you. And so I think there has to be some input in place which helps young players, firstly, how to use it, because, you know, players, I feel like some players are using it. Some players do use it good, but some players aren't using it right. And and then how to, to deal with that, because it's a big part of the game now. Um, moving forward past that season, I don't really want to spend too long um, talking about your your injuries. I don't really think it's it, it's necessary because we you know we're trying to talk about your football. Um, but after 17 months, you make your first appearance um, back in the first team uh, in in a game at QPR, and you you know you win man of the match for that for that game. Um, I want to really know not necessarily about the injury, but the period of time that you were injured. How difficult was that mentally to to see yourself getting back to that level? And then how did you feel after that game, knowing what you, you'd just done? Yeah, that was, it was a difficult time because I never had an injury before that. Even like growing up in, in the academy or in the youth team, I used to play all the time. I used to play school football. And as I said, I just loved playing football. Um, and then I'd obviously broke into the first team that year and had a really good year and thought, now right, this is my chance. I need to... to to keep working hard to get better and and keep keep playing at the top level, you know, keep Arsenal in the Champions League, and I was a really important player at that at that point as well. Um, and then yeah, I got I picked up a little injury in the pre-season game, and you know I, I didn't think anything of it. I thought oh, I've, I've hurt my ankle. I'll be back in a few days or whatever. Um, and then having having the tests and scans, realised pretty soon it was it was quite serious, and um, yeah, it was difficult because. It went on for so long. Like I don't obviously had an ankle injury and then came back and got a knee injury, and I was thinking, like, what What do I have to do just to get back to training? Like I can't get anywhere near it. I'd break down after you know five or six running sessions, and that that helped me a lot as well. And in terms of realizing the demands and what you have to do to to play at the top level. And even like, I know it says I was out for seventeen months, but I probably was out for for about fourteen months, and then started training and playing with the uh, the under twenty threes at the time. And it just took me that time to get up to that level. And I remember the morning of that game. Normally, the boss gave the team the day before the game, and he didn't. I didn't think anything of it. And then about three hours before kickoff, he puts the team up, and I was in it. And I remember thinking, I'm I'm ready for this. And he obviously did did that for the, for that reason because he didn't want me going to bed the night before thinking or worrying about it. Um, and yeah, I mean, the feeling after that game was because as well in that game I got absolutely smashed by someone, and I remember always thinking that in the back of my head, like what if what if I get smashed because I'm that type of player who who wants to run with the ball. And you know, I was, I'd played a few games with the 23s, but it weren't the Premier League, and you weren't playing against men. And yeah, I remember after that game, just you know, absolutely buzzing, like just thinking, right now I'm back here. I need to do what what it takes and what I can to stay here. You mentioned there a little bit about how difficult it was to physically get to the to the level that you needed to be com- to compete at a Premier League. Um, specifically, what sort of stuff were you doing? Um, and at what point did you, obviously before the game, you've just said there that you weren't sure if you were ready or not. Like, what is the perception of being ready to play in the top level? Like, what do you have to do? I think when I think about it, the perception I, I give it is, is not really fitness because this is my first game in ages. Adrenaline would, would get me through that. And, and yeah, it'll be difficult. But I think if a game isn't difficult for someone, then 
they're probably not pushing themselves as hard as they can. Um, and my perception was like rhythm on the ball. You know, would I be able, able to still do the same things? Would I be able to go up to a player and, and beat him, get close to him like the type of player I am? And that was was more in my mind. It's more of a, a technical thing. Like I don't want to give the ball away. I don't want to make silly mistakes. Um, and I've always said as well throughout my throughout my whole career, and it's probably not a good thing because it can determine certain things, certain games. And I always think about the first pass, like your first touch. And if that's good, then okay, you can build on it. Um, and usually, you know, I can't remember a game where, because I'm so focused on that, where like your first touch, you give it simple and then yeah, okay, you're in the game. And, and yeah, that was going through my head a lot. The, so p people obviously trying to reach the top level um, may or may not be there at this moment. A lot of the guys probably listening to this will be at, a, you know, a low level. Do you feel like they can attain the training standards of, of a top level guy and, and what do they look like? Um, yeah, I think you've always got to have, have that focus in, in your mind because I mean, I, I think about players who, who've had a different way of getting to the top than I did, you know, Jamie Vardy, he's even players like Delhi Ali, uh, Delhi was in a, an academy, but playing at a lower league team and, and then got his opportunity and you know Vardy look at Vardy who came through um, non-league and, and now he's played in World Cup so I think in terms of, of keeping that focus and, and training right eating right I think anyone could do that um, but I think a lot of it comes from your focus and your drive and where you want to be where you want to get to sorry and what you're going to do to get to because I think that is the fundamentals, you know, you have to live right, you have to eat right, you have to get your training right, and and give yourself the best opportunity for when that opportunity comes around to take it. Because, you know, I mean, it could happen whenever. I mean, I, I, as I said, I played with players who who have gone that way about it, and I remember speaking to uh, to Vardy at the World Cup, and he always thought he was good enough. He always thought he would one day get to the top and there's, there's different ways of doing it but I think one thing you can do is make sure you give yourself the best opportunity definitely the um so the next few years after that um season um sort of you know after the the moment you come back from that injury they seem to end up in, in a combination of you playing really well and contributing to, to successful results um I think obviously FA Cup wins uh, to two of the FA Cups um and then sustaining injuries and recovering, and and that seemed to be the uh, you know a theme of, of performing really well, having to spend a, a bit of time out performing really well, um, and include England in that as well because when you were fit for England, you played like you 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 went straight back in the team. How much of a challenge in time was that for you in in terms of like you say getting into a rhythm, um, and how difficult was it physically to to almost yo-yo from injury to to play. Yeah, I think the the first injury and the way I came back from that really helped me deal with the other injuries because I knew that I could get back and that that first injury was the most serious injury I've ever had. So yeah, it was frustrating, but I knew that I could come back to that level and I always had the confidence in myself that once I'd get the opportunity, I'd take it and come back to a good level. But I, I also knew what you had to do with the rehab, uh, with the work you had to do with the fitness team before coming back. And I was always, I always drove that myself, you know, like I knew if I was ready to come back into training or if I wasn't, or if they were holding me back, I'd always push them. And I think that first injury really helped me deal with everything that came after. The, so finding consistency, obviously, in, in your game, was that challenging every time you did come back? You, you obviously, you, you don't question your ability, but was it challenging trying to find the, the level that you were at every time? Um, yeah, it was. And what was challenging is you knew that, yeah, you could come back to a good level, but after five games or 10 games, you'd be even better. And it was about, again, having the trust of the manager to give you that, that chance of, of building up to the level that, 
that you need to be at really and um finding that consistency was 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 difficult at times but i knew what it would take to get it i knew that the more you played and your confidence came back and you could have more, more of an influence on games but you had to play the games and he was always good with, to be fair Arsenal with me with that he would he would respect that and and give me that chance to come back the majority of your injuries i know i said i wasn't going to talk about them too much but the majority of them um in football you probably don't get people saying they're lucky or unlucky quite a lot but it seemed to be that you were like the unluckiest man ever and all these injuries were impacts and and that's obviously rare but you seem to manage to, to pick a lot of them up um i'm interested to know if people that at home or listen to this or ha suffer injuries and they're unlucky and they're no through no fault of their own how did you manage to deal with that and what advice could you give them on on how they can deal with that too yeah i think the biggest one is is trust in your ability to come back um yeah, it's difficult at times because all you want to do is is go and play football and if an injury is holding you back that ain't ain't your fault then it's difficult to accept and you know some people could go the other way and go off the rails but i think you always have to, what kept me going was was running out i know i was lucky enough to be a big club but running out in front of the fans having that pressure of being involved in big games that's what what kept me going and if i could give any advice it would probably be as, as simple as it sounds is keep going because i did that and that's all i did you know i kept going injury after injury i kept going i kept working i kept believing that i could come back and i deserve that opportunity to come back and and as well i think like one thing a lot of people used to always say to me is oh you're going to change your game are you you know you're going to give it a little bit earlier or are you still going to run with it and i think you can't change that because that takes away your identity and that's all you've got really as a player is who you are what you what you're good at and you can't change that and i've never changed that i always wanted to be the same player and and yeah it's a risk because you're putting yourself in a position where yeah you can get tackled and someone might mistime it and and you're injured again but you know that is who i am that's why i started playing football and why i love playing football and i'm, I'm not going to change that that moves me quite nicely into to, you know to this next next little bit of your game had developed over that period of time and I've, I've, you know, I've, I've read things that you said about wanting to play different positions on the pitch at Arsenal, off the back of playing for England in, in a specifically in that deep line midfield role, but not in a way that English fans and teams had perceived it before. But on how European teams now had their most technical player playing in that number four role. Um, genuinely, was it tough for you to, to obviously want to express your football? And you see yourself playing in this position. It's obviously worked in in some level, and you want to go back to Arsenal and do that uh, on a you know on a regular basis. Was that tough for you to? You had a perception of how football was, but England as a as a league had a different perception of of what it looked like. Yeah, yeah it was it was tough because obviously I felt I could show myself to everyone best in a in a deep line role and I wanted to play that and I'd played that with England and played well and felt really comfortable there. Um, and then literally the op I was the opposite. I was number 10 in the team and that was, it was difficult. And um, I had many conversations with, with Arson and I remember one that stands out and obviously it's not Arson's fault, but I just played in that role for England and I came back and I said to the boss, and I was like, Look, I want to play there. And he was like, no, I, I wanted to play 10 and we played um, we played Man United at home and I played in the 10 played well um, and then I think it was about the 60th minute I'm in the 10 position I got the ball and I turned and I pushed it past uh, Paddy McNair it was and he completely wiped me out and uh, he ruptured my whole ankle ligaments and I was out for three months and I remember thinking after if I weren't playing number 10 I wouldn't have got injured but um, yeah I mean look I think I always trusted the boss, to be honest. Always trusted his opinion. Um, and he played me in the 10 because he thought that was best for the team. You know, I would have much rather have played deeper, but if I had to play 10 to be in the team, I wanted to play. So, 
yeah, I mean, listen, I, I talk about the 10 like I didn't enjoy it. I actually did enjoy it at times and it got you more opportunities to create things or get closer to the goal. Um, so, yeah, I enjoy playing it, but I always saw myself a little bit deeper. The Bournemouth loan. So it's, you know, it, it's a period of time where um, I think you were obviously looking to play consistently again. Um, I've spoken to Cookie, obviously, when, when you first joined, I asked Steve, like, oh, you know, what's, what's he like in, in real, in, like in training? He said, this guy's unbelievable. Like, he, he's amazing. None of the guys had ever seen a, a player like you before. Um, did you know, coming into a level, and I'm interested, obviously, for people listening, when they're at a certain level and they're perceived to go to a, you know, to a team that's below them, possibly, mm. um, what was that like? And, and were you aware of how people perceived you when, when you moved to Bournemouth? Yeah, that was something that was I was quite nervous about, actually, because... Um, because coming to Bournemouth, speaking to Eddie, I knew that a big part of the success they had here was down to the team spirit. Um, and I was confident that I'm, I'm the type of guy who can get on with anyone and fit in anywhere, but I didn't know how they'd accept me in. All the lads that had been here for a while, been through League One, into the champ, now they're in, in the Premier League. And I didn't want them to think of me as this, this kid, or not a kid, I was 24, this guy who's coming from from a big club just to play games, but he don't really care. So I brought into the, the team spirit really early and I wanted to to make sure that that was one of the main things that I, I'd done when I came here. And to be fair, all the boys, they were brilliant with me. You know, they helped me massively settle in. Um, you know, they... What helped as well was, I know it was different and different players, but a lot of the philosophy of the club was similar to Arsenal. A little bit different in, in some aspects, but, you know, Eddie wanted to play out, all the boys wanted to play out. Um, they'd take risks on the ball and sometimes it wouldn't work and we'd be punished, but we'd still stick at it. Um, but yeah, there was a, when I first signed, I was a little bit nervous of how the boys would accept me, but they were brilliant. You end up pretty quickly, you know, you're sort of winning Player of the Month awards, um, what was it like going from a you know uh, an environment where you're expected to win every game to an environment now where you're possibly not expected to win every game and it's you know a different mentality of that everyone's desperate to win but not expected to win. Yeah, um, it was strange really because I felt at the time that we should be achieving more than we were. And I remember having conversations with Eddie um, and getting a little bit frustrated because uh, there were games where where I felt like we had a great team and we finished ninth, I know, and it was a great season for us. But there were times where there were games we should have won and I felt like we weren't, we weren't expressing ourselves enough. Um, and that was, that was quite difficult to, to get... To, not to accept, but uh, to to learn really that yeah we weren't expected to win every game. Whereas I was going into the games thinking right we're going to win this today, and there were some big big games that we won, and then there were some games that we didn't where we should have won, um, and that was difficult to accept. But I, I listen. I had a great year. I enjoyed every enjoyed myself massively. I came. I got myself back to a level where I could absolutely have an influence on games. Um, and I remember having that conversation with Eddie as well when I first came and he was brilliant with me and like he would, he, he, we had a long conversation about what he thinks I need to get back to that level. And and we did, we did it, you know, we, I took my time, I think for the first maybe two or three months, I didn't play 90 minutes, you know, he brought me in, he brought me in slowly. I started on the bench and then built myself up and I got back to a level where I was confident going into games that I can have a real influence on it. I can create things and yeah, it was a good year. A lot of guys, uh, especially at the top level and young players now, it's seen as like a lone move as perceived as almost a negative now. And, and you're speaking about the two loans that you've had Bolton and Bournemouth as being really important experiences for you. What would you, you know, what sort of advice would you give to, to players in similar position who, who feel like they want to go and play 
but don't want it to be perceived as a negative move. Well, I think the most important thing, as I said before, is Saturday at three o'clock. And you don't want to be sat on the bench at Saturday at three o'clock. And I know that sometimes isn't as easy as just going on loan because, as I said before, there's a process. But I think a change of environment, change of mentality, a change of surroundings really helped me. Um, I'd I'd spent a year or eight months injured at Arsenal and I went to the Euros. I probably weren't fit enough to go to the Euros, but the manager took me. I played a few games. Didn't really have a good tournament. Um, and then came back in, in pre-season and felt I did all right, but started on the bench. And I remember thinking, am I going to be happy with this? Like maybe 15 games where you're coming off the bench, starting some, starting not really the important ones. Um, or do I want to go out and really have a right go at trying to get back to a level um, where where I can come back? Because my, my, my plan was always to go back to Arsenal and I'd never thought that going on loan would hinder that. I always thought that it would help me and it did. I think the proof is there that I went on loan, I came back, okay, I was injured, I broke my leg, but... When I was when I was fit again, I got back into the Arsenal team, and that was that was the goal, that was the plan, and it gave me that when I came in, it gave me that hunger back and that feeling of playing week in week out again, and and that was massive for me. So I don't think it should ever be seen as a negative, even if you have to drop a league or drop two leagues. You're going out, you're playing football, you're you're learning something different, and and that can only help you. When you've been fit. In your career, more often than not, you've you've played, you've been picked. Um, so getting to the point now where you obviously make the decision to leave Arsenal, uh, I can imagine there was a lot of people obviously who wanted you to go there and sign. I've I've read about the you know this West Ham move, and you were basically under the impression that the football was going to suit you. Um, not only how difficult was was it of a decision for you to make, um, but knowing that obviously every time you were fit you'd play how even more difficult was that to leave Arsenal know, knowing that if you could get yourself physically uh, at the right condition you'd, you'd probably play yeah well my decision was based around playing because I knew that um, if if I was fit I would play under the previous manager and then obviously a new manager came in and I'd been offered a deal um, and I just I didn't want to sign it and I got offered a deal when Arsenal was there and then Obviously, he announced that he was leaving at the end of the season and I wanted to see who was going to come in because I wanted to play. And I knew straight away from that from that conversation with uh, Emery at the time that I weren't in his plans. And a lot of people said to me, yeah, but you probably would have played if, if you'd have stayed and worked hard and been patient. But I just had a feeling from him that he wasn't feeling me. He obviously was going to bring in his own midfielders that he fancied and... And yeah, so it was it was a difficult decision because I've been there for so long, but it was made easier by the fact that I sat down with with the manager, I looked him in his eye, and I just got that that feeling that he wasn't he wasn't having me, and all I wanted to do at that stage was play as well. And and then when I went to sit down with the the new West Ham manager at the time, I felt like I was really important to him. He really wanted me, um, and yeah, that's why that's why I left really. A lot of people will probably be in a similar position where uh, I've got friends now at much lower levels who, who are, don't want to play in teams because they get a feeling off the manager that they're, that they're not in his plans. Mm. For people in that situation and, and going through that themselves who may be favoured by one manager and possibly not yeah. by the other, um, how can they deal with that and, and what sort of advice would you give to them? Yeah, that's tough because that happens all at all levels in football and... I mean, it's difficult because you're put in a position where actually you can't really do much because if the manager's not, if you're not in the manager's plans, then what can you do? Yeah, you can train well, you can train hard um, and you just have to somehow get in, get yourself in front of him and listen, that opportunity could come through injury, someone's injured and then you get your chance and you have to take it. But that that is one of the most difficult positions in football because I see it all the time. You know, I see boys down, their their confidence is low, and it and it affects them on a day to day basis because they're footballers and all they want to do is is playing games. And yeah, you can train and 
and and do whatever. But there ain't a, a better feeling than when Saturday comes and you're walking out preparing for a game. It's, it's the best feeling in the world. And to have that taken away because of one person's opinion is difficult to accept. But you have to you have to remain professional and do the right things, live right still, because you never know when that opportunity might come. The recently I've you know I listened to the podcast that you did with the uh, Sky Sports guys on Super Six um, talking about I think it was in a period of time in lockdown where you possibly still were weren't signed to a club um, and exploring the options that you had and you spoke about obviously the football that you like to play and and um, and what kind of player you were and how that suited possibly moving abroad is that something that you you know is is still on your mind or, or, and, and still a possibility. I think so, and I think this this little spell at Bournemouth from January to now, you know, playing nineteen, twenty games, training every day, has has been so good for me because, you know, I said before that I always had that that confidence in myself. But when you're without a club for three months, and there's not many, you know, you had a, I had a few options that, you know, like one in Australia, which I just didn't want to do, and things like that would. When I left West Ham, I was thinking, right, teams are going to come up, I'm going to have different options. And they didn't. And I don't care who you are, that's going to affect your confidence. And it wasn't until, you know, I rang uh, Tyndall myself and said, um, can I come down and train? And it wasn't until I got in front of a, a manager and impressed him where he went, actually, should we do something to the end of the season? So that gave me confidence in myself. And then, obviously, everyone knows that the championship is a brutal league. It's very demanding. You, know, you have to prepare yourself right, and I've got that confidence back in my body. Where, whereas before, you know, if someone said, "Oh, would you go abroad?" I'd have liked the thought of it, but if I got out, I'd, I'd always be thinking in the back of my head, "What if I got out there and I got injured, then I'm stuck out there?" Whereas now, I don't have that doubt because because I've trained every day, I've played. If an injuries can happen, whatever. But in terms of trusting my body, I've got that back again. I think that could be a really important message of a guy of, of obviously your level and, and talent that in the period of time where you expected obviously to leave West Ham and to move straight on in, into some way, it was a difficult time. And, um, you know, we spoke before about, uh, uh, you know, before recording about um, you going out to Dubai and training and stuff. How tough, um, you know, was that period of time, uh, especially now, obviously, with, with what's going on recently? It's going to be a lot of guys, especially it's this summer, a lot of guys out of contract, you know, difficult really knowing what they're going to do. One, how tough was that for you? And and two, what can these guys in that position do to help themselves? Yeah, well, when I left West Ham, it was, it was kind of, I don't want to say a relief because I don't want to talk bad about West Ham because I'm a West Ham fan who, who played for West Ham and so I lived my dream. But... um. At the time, things weren't working out and I just wanted to get out and play somewhere. And that is what I thought. I genuinely thought that, yeah, I'd leave. I'm a free agent and someone will come and, and take a chance on me. But it just didn't come about. And how Dubai came about, I was I was, um, I was, was close to going to Cyprus, playing Cypriot League. And I didn't really want to do it, but I didn't have anything else. So so I was thinking, oh, I might as well do it to the end of the season. And, and then literally at the last minute, I decided... Now, I'm not going to throw myself into something that I don't want to do that I don't think will be good for me. And when I mean last minute, I'd like pack my bags. So I was thinking, sat down with the missus and said, look, this is getting, like, I was locked down. I said, I can't keep waking up, going to Hatfield uh, Park, and running around it on my own and doing that. Like, I, I'm hating it. I don't want to do it. Like, I'm thinking about everything just to put it off. You know, I'd wake up and I'd sit in the house till like five just before it got dark and then think, oh, I've got to go out now. And it was just breaking me. So I thought, right, I said to the missus, look, come, we're going to go to uh, to Dubai. I know a guy over there, Chris, who who's like a trainer, just for a change of scenery and, like, to, just to get away from everything. Um, and listen, everyone's been having a difficult time this year because of lockdown, and I was fortunate enough that I could do that. Um, but that did give me a lift. Like, it changed my, my, my mood completely, it made me made me a little bit more focused on trying to get something, you know, and and that was when I came back from there, you know, a few days later, I thought, well, I need to get into a team just to just for training, just to be around players again because it's been so long. Obviously, I couldn't 
just going anywhere because there was there was COVID rules and and I think I think uh, football had been called off then as well. I mean, um, grassroots football, so I couldn't even go train with like, my mates. Um, so I rang Jace and and he was brilliant. He said, "Yeah, come down, come down and train." And I generally didn't didn't think that it would it would work out. Or that, sorry, not that it would work out. That it would happen because obviously there was there was midfielders here or whatever. So I didn't even cross my mind. I just wanted to get in front of other players and train. And it was after two weeks. And and I remember uh, my agent rang me. I was driving back to London. My agent rang me and told me they wanted to do something. And I just couldn't keep the smile off my face. I felt like a little kid again who's who's going back to play football. And yeah, it was it was a good feeling. I think a common theme of everything we've spoken about here and, and what's probably really important for people to try and take away is that you seem to take responsibility for, for all your stuff. So um, when you were injured, you took responsibility for, for your rehab. When you wanted to work hard as a player, you took responsibility. When you, for whatever reason, were without a club, despite not wanting to, you still, uh, you know, you, you went and you trained and, and you put yourself in a position where you'd be able to, to come back to a club and play. How important for these guys, obviously, wanting to become professional footballers or who are, how important is being responsible and and looking after your own stuff. Yeah, I think that's massive because we're taught as kids growing up, and rightly so, to to listen to your coach. And yeah, you have to listen to your coach. Of course, you do. You're you're playing for a team, and he's the coach, so you have to. But as well, taking responsibility in terms of if you feel you need something else, if you need to do some running after training, or you need to work on something that that you need to improve then you have to take that responsibility yourself because you might get a few coaches who who will help you with that but a lot of a lot of things are based around the team you know we're always preparing for a game especially in this league you're, you're preparing for a game every three days and sometimes it's, it's difficult not to get caught up in that and forget about what you need or what you need to improve on so yeah, taking responsibility is, is something that I've learned through my career is massive because you know what you need and what what is going to make you you feel right to to be ready for for Saturday three o'clock again. Like always coming back to that. That is the for me. Like as I said, after a game, I always think about the next game and like what's going to happen and what do I need to do to to make sure I'm right for that. We're going to finish uh, up, mate. If if it's okay with some quick fires and mm-hmm. and that'll be us, mate. So. Um, number one is the best lesson you learned off the players you played with at Arsenal. Probably Fabregas and how he he controlled a game. Like a guy who was not quick, he weren't strong, but he was the best player. Whenever he played, he was the best player. And he, I saw him control games. Like he was always... He was always aware of his surroundings and like he always saw a picture before anyone else. The ball came to him and he'd like pop it off or he'd take a touch and turn. He always made the right decision. Um, I know we've we've touched on it a little bit, but how best can a player deal with the pressure of modern day social media? I think the simple answer to that would be don't get don't get carried away when things are going well. And don't get too low when when things aren't going so well. Um, apart from Arsene Wenger, which manager have you enjoyed working with the most and what do you do for your game? It's tough because I really enjoyed Eddie, but Roy Hodgson played me for my country in a deep line midfield role where I always wanted to play. So it's probably him and his coaching staff. Gary Neville was there at the time. Ray Lewington, who who really helped me and really helped me understand that role, that deep line midfield role that he put you in. Did you want to play that before he he did that, or did you know you could not, play it? After? Not like that. I always wanted to play like I always grew up playing a four-two-three-one, and I always wanted to be one of the two. But then with England, we played a diamond, and uh, so we played one-two-one, and I was the deep line one, and I wasn't sure at first. And I remember sitting down with with Gary Neville and watching videos of Pirlo. We watched Pirlo so much and like how he controlled it from there. And even going into the first game, I wasn't sure. And it wasn't until after the first game where we beat Switzerland 2-0 where I thought, 
oh yeah, I really enjoyed that. I felt comfortable and this is something that I could do. Um, best things to do with, uh, best things to do to deal with suffering and recovering from injuries. I think setting goals and what I mean by that is staying focused and, and driven on what you want to achieve and where you want to go with that. Uh, the best performance of your career, in your opinion. Mm. I say your opinion because yeah. everybody would. You know what I'm going to say? When I scored my my two England goals, uh, it was against Slovenia, and everything went well. I played in a deep line role. I scored two goals, like probably the two best goals I've ever scored. I never hit anything like that again, and everything just went right. Like I felt good. I didn't really give the ball away. So yeah, I'll say that. Apart from talent, what are the most important attributes players need to be successful in football now? I think something that drives them um, something that drives them which keeps them focused and and hard work. Like you can't get away from hard work. You have to when I mean hard work, I don't mean right hard work in, in just in the game. Like you have to work hard, of course, but I mean in training and pushing yourself to get the best out of yourself. Current career ambitions? Um, short term, obviously, to get Bournemouth back in the Premier League. Um, and long term, it's a difficult question because... I actually don't know. Like I know that I want to play at the highest level possible and to keep pushing myself and keep that focus and 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 when that focus and that self self drive goes is when I know that that I'm done and until I lose that I'll keep going and trying to play as high level as I can. What advice would you give to a 16-year-old Jack Wilkshire? Um, I'd say to to maintain to maintain your hunger towards towards the game throughout good times and bad times because there's going to be bad times there, there isn't anyone's career but you have to stay driven and focused and and try and as as hard as you can to get the good times back. I mean, it sounds as if you you have done that. You've always yeah. taken your advice. Um, last one. What advice would you give to players who are one of the most talented players at their level or, or age group? I'd say that they should be thankful that they've got that talent, but don't waste it because I've seen so many. And, and when I mean waste it, I don't mean like throw it all away. I mean that you don't develop that talent like you've got something go after it, like try and improve it, show, and try and prove to everyone, show everyone how much talent you've got. Appreciate it, mate. Thank you very much for your time. Cheers, Jack. Guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode. Talking to Jack about his incredible career and the experiences he's had was so insightful for me. His experiences show just what it takes to be a player at the top level of the game. Hopefully the things that we've spoken about today can help you all moving forward to give yourselves the best possible chance of playing at the highest level you can. To get a summary of all the valuable takeaways from today's episode, make sure you follow the show notes or head straight to the ePerform website. We will give you the key moments from each episode and put them into a clear roadmap of how to include the information straight into your game. Don't forget, if you like our content and want to see more, please write us a review, leave a comment and please subscribe. Alternatively, head to the website and sign up to our mailing list to receive world-class information straight to your inbox every week for free to help leave no doubt in your game. Thank you once again to Jack for joining me and talking about his journey. See you all next week for another great episode that I can't wait to share with you all. I've been Joe Partington. See you guys soon.